Outside, should I run and hide? How do I tape my company worldwide? Do you love the law? Did you watch Hee Haw? What's the weirdest thing that you ever saw? What's it like in court? Favorite sport? Can you help with my book report? Is my hair too long? Am I right or wrong? And do you mind if I sing along to anything? Ask Alan anything in the world. Hello, everybody, and welcome to this uh, episode of Ask Alan, the podcast. I'm Alan Crone, the CEO of the Crone Law Firm. And um, with me today, I'm, I'm very excited to have the uh, extremely photogenic and uh, competent uh, Ursula Madden uh, on, uh, on the program. Ursula, as many of you know, uh, is the uh, Chief Communications Officer for the City of Memphis. Uh, she is a uh, she's world famous in Memphis, having been um, an anchor of the WMC TV Channel 5 News uh, and uh, just a, a great person. Uh, Ursula, welcome to the to the show. Alan, I'm so happy to be here and thanks for thinking of me. And um, it's great to catch up and, and to see you. Well, thank you. Thank you. I've, I've missed my time uh, in City Hall. Uh, but, you know, there's a season for everything, and, and I've moved on to other things. But you're still there in the trenches, and, and uh, I, I'm, I'm glad that you are because you're doing a great job. Well, thank you very much. And, and it is a little bit like uh, being in a battle every day. Um, a, lot of, a lot of highs, a lot of low lows, but um, it's, it's fantastic. It's great to serve the citizens of Memphis. Well, would you, would you kind of explain to uh, listeners what uh, what what does your job uh, entail? Uh, you know, communications director. A lot of people think that means uh, you know just being the spokesperson for the mayor, but you certainly do that. But you do a lot more than that. Sure. So this position um, evolved greatly in 2016 when Jim Strickland was elected to um, become our mayor. It used to just be a public information officer who primarily that person's duty was to um, provide talking points and be a spokesperson for the mayor. Um, when he brought me on in 2016, he said, I want a chief communications officer who does communications for the city. And so uh, it's not just, I, I tend to look at our communications team as sort of a public relations and crisis communications firm within city government. And what we do is we represent all of our clients. So all of our divisions, uh, whether it is engineering or public works or solid waste, um, and including the executive division of the mayor's office. And um, we try to provide them with the best PR, with uh, the best social media presence, with the best talking points and event planning, and um, the list goes on and on about um, what we try to do for our different divisions. But so the role has greatly expanded, um, not just a spokesperson for the mayor, but really a spokesperson um, for the city. And um, since we came here in 2016, we try to speak with one voice so that the right hand knows what the left hand is doing. Yeah, it's not just communication outwardly, it's also communication internally, correct? That is true. So also responsible for communicating different changes within our HR division to um, our different divisions here in city government and to also keep them informed. We just passed a budget. So there are some, some different things that are coming out of there in terms of um, what we're calling premium pay that is from the ARPA funds, the ARPA federal funds. That has to be communicated. Uh, we just sent out a memo about that yesterday. And it could be something as simple as hey, we're having a City of Memphis family picnic. <laughs> so come on out for the weekend and have a good time with your family and friends. What has been your, um, what do you, where do you think you've made the biggest difference in that transition from, um, you know, kind of a, a, a mouthpiece for just the mayor to having a more integrated communication strategy for the, for the whole city? Well, I think that 
I think that people are a little bit more aware of what is going on in city government, at least I hope. What we've tried to do with our communications is meet people where they are. So if that's on social media, if that's on next door, if that is um, through the mayor's weekly email that we send out to about 35,000 subscribers, um, we try to meet people where they are and talk about the things that matter to them and take them along on this journey. Um, I, I kind of considered an adventure what's going to happen each and every day. We don't know, but city government has such an impact on people's lives. And if you're doing it right, they don't even know. Um, if, you're, if your roads are smooth and your garbage is collected and um, you know, you're doing a groundbreaking on um, three or four new buildings that are going up in the next 18 months, People, you know, don't know that's their city government at work, but they know if it's if it's going wrong. So the challenge is uh, making sure people know what's going on in city government to the best of our ability, and then also communicating when things aren't going quite well, um, and to take people along for that ride too, because they deserve to know. That's right, and you know, it excellence sometimes is doing a lot of little things right consistently. Y'all do big well, but, uh, you know, for example, you mentioned that email that the mayor sends out. I, you know, I remember it started out at about three or 4,000 names. And, you know, we really thought we were big time sending out three or 4,000 emails uh, a week. And now it's over 35,000. And, you know, of all the things that the Strickland administration has done, I think that's one of the most impactful because people come up to me all the time and say, oh, I get his emails, it's wonderful. And, and all it really is doing is just telling people what's going on. It, it, those emails usually don't cover, um, sometimes they do big announcements, but usually it's, it's pretty mundane stuff, but just letting people know what's going on with city government. Oh yeah, I mean, it's one of the things that the mayor gets the most compliments on uh, since he's been up here too is, gosh, love that email, you know, keep it up. And, you know, it's explaining things like pilots and tourism development zones and what happened at city council. And the thing that I love about it and get excited about it is it's not through the filter of any other media organization. It's, you know, this is straight from the mayor's desk telling you what is going on inside, you know, your government, the government that your taxes pay for. And, um, you know, there's no, there's no spin on it because it's, it's our presentation of the facts um, without someone else's interpretation. And so we, I love the direct communication approach. You know, uh, we, do, we do that um, with Nextdoor as well. Um, Nextdoor started off as sort of like, oh, we'll, we'll kind of dip our toe into this and see how it works. Now there's 108,000 households who subscribe to City of Memphis Nextdoor. So we can push the message out that way. And what's great about it is you can get down into a community. You don't have to send a message to all 108,000 households. You can send, maybe it's just to Orange Man or you know, a certain zip code. So I, I love the flexibility and our ability to communicate um, directly to people. Yeah, and you know, I think a lot of people who watch this and listen to this podcast are business people, entrepreneurs, and I think that's a good lesson for uh, the private sector as well, is you, you, you can't just use one channel of communication anymore. You can't just do television or radio or Facebook. You've really got to get across the board because different people use different platforms for uh, communication. Unlike when, when I was growing up, you had three television channels and that was about it. And a daily newspaper. Yes. Yeah, now today, if people don't see it on their social media timeline, it didn't happen and it's not true. <laughs> so it's, it's, you know, it's evolving and media has really evolved even in the last four or five years, it's evolved even more. There's just so much diversity in where you can get information and where people choose to get information. And if you don't evolve with it, you, you kind of end up potentially going the way of the dinosaurs. Sure, sure. Well, let's uh, let's talk about. Let's not go all the way back to the dinosaurs. Um, <laughs> but now I know because you and I are friends. I know that you're from the Great Northwest, 
You didn't grow up in Memphis. Uh, you grew up in Oregon. How, how does uh, uh, a girl from Oregon uh, find her way to Memphis, Shelby County, Tennessee? Well, the simple answer to that is television news. <laughs> so I, um, I graduated from the University of Oregon and um, started working right away in the field of broadcast journalism. And what happens in journalism is, especially in the broadcast industry, is no reporter stays still for more than two years at a time. It would be, you know, death to your career, so to speak. Um, so you move around. Um, I have worked at one station in Eugene and uh, had um, reached my maximum capacity there in terms of what I was going to learn and if I was going to be promoted. So I moved to another station, gave myself another two years there. And then I was like, you know what? I've got to make a move to a larger market and I'm gonna give myself three months to do it. And if I'm not doing this, I'm switching. And um, fortunately, sort of when it rains, it pours, I, I ended up getting an offer from uh, Jackson, Mississippi and from Memphis, Tennessee and um, chose WMC. Um, boy, was that a great move. Um, it was just, it was just one of the best things that's probably happened to me career-wise um, ever. And, um, you know, just the family and the camaraderie and um, the growth and the knowledge and just getting to know the Mid-South and Memphis, uh, it was a challenge. So that kept my interest. Um, but also, you know, my ambition was to always become a main anchor at some point. Um, but to be a main anchor, you gotta be a really good reporter. And um, I wanted to do that as well. And I was able to do that in my 17, 18 years at WMT. What, uh, you got any memorable uh, stories of uh, stories you covered? Yeah, so, you know. Um, that you could talk about. Uh, public. That I could talk about. <laughs> uh, you know, um, I always had the most fun with the stories that um, weren't as serious. Um, you know, I love that we had a senior citizen softball league, and then I got to go watch those guys play. Um, love the stories that um, we always did at St. Jude Children's Research Hospital for the giveaways of the house every year because it was so uplifting. Um, and unfortunately, a lot of times in, in local news, you see a lot of tragic things. Um, and so I always treasured the things that were um, just uplifting in light. One, one memory I have in particular is, um, it's not even a new story, but just, you know, some of the people who would come by to the station. And um, one morning, early morning, uh, Al Green comes strolling into the newsroom because he's doing a, an interview and a talk back with MSNBC. And um, we watched him do his interview because we were just as in awe of him as, as they were. And um, he did a little impromptu concert for us. He sang love and happiness to all the ladies in the room. And it was just, it was fantastic. Yeah. It was fantastic. You know, um, I, I treasure that memory. I treasure flying with the Blue Angels and getting sick in the jet. <laughs> Nothing like going at Mach 6 and an F-18 and being halfway to Nashville in like five seconds. So, you know, just a lot of fun things. Um, those are the things that stand out the most to me. Now, was there a was there a particular story or a particular event that where, where you made your bones that you know established you as a Memphis reporter and put propelled you towards the anchor desk? I feel like those I have a lot of those, um, almost too many to remember. You know, the, the longer you stay alive, the more you forget. Yeah. <laughs> Um, one story that was really tragic to me was um, talking about the number of teen pregnancies in uh, the city of Memphis in a given year. Um, I think in hindsight, I think that made national news, but I also think it exposed something that was very uncomfortable for Memphians and the city of Memphis, and nobody knew quite how to deal with it. I think not even our newsroom really understood the impact that making that reveal or telling that story was going to have um, on the community. Um, but it was also something, sometimes you, you, you turn over a rock and you see the ugly that's underneath. 
And sometimes that's what's needed to be done so that you can try and help, a, help find a solution to an issue. So I think that's one of the stories. Um, I think I had a lot. Uh, <laughs> you know, some of them were, some of them are more tragic than, than uh, that I would like. One of the stories that I actually got an Emmy for, which is um, kind of ironic in a way, because it has to do with the Memphis Police Department, but they used to do an undercover uh, training camp for undercover officers down in Mississippi. And um, one of the uh, instructors was this uh, former FBI agent who went undercover and um, he was uh, help you know train these guys. So I got to go down there, see what they go through, see their training. And it was insight that nobody else had done before. And so that, that got me an Emmy Award. So I was always grateful for the Memphis Police Department for that. Well, very nice, very nice. So this is the question everybody watching this wants, wants me to ask, and that is this. Is Joe Birch really as nice of a guy in person as he is on the air? He's the best. Oh, yeah, that's my TV husband. Yeah, uh, former TV husband. I guess I can't claim him anymore. But um, yeah, he's a uh, salt of the earth, just down to earth guy, really cares about Memphis, really cares about storytelling. And that's his real hair. <laughs> <laughs> um, he, is, he is a great guy. It, it, uh, you know, you you hear he gets a lot of accolades and, and so forth, but he does a lot of, of really great things under the radar. He doesn't ask for any recognition. And if there's a, you know, if there's a, a, a charity that needs a, a, a master of ceremonies, he's one of the first ones to step up and do it. And um, uh, I know that you two were partners for a long time. And uh, it's got to be great to have someone like that. And I think he would probably say the same thing for, for you, having you know, someone quality on the other side of the desk has got to make you better. It's got to up your game. Oh, totally. Bring your A game when you're uh, with Joe Birch. I considered him a mentor before we became uh, a partners on the anchor set. Um, I always appreciated his work ethic. He just, he worked really hard. Um, even before he got into the doors of the station, like he said, if somebody needed an MC or needed something done, Joe was there to do it. Um, he's been a volunteer in this community uh, for so long with his race for um, St. Patrick's and um, his delivering of meal, meals for uh, MIFA. Um, you know, he delivered meals. And when I first got here, I delivered meals for five years because Joe Birch did it. <laughs> and I thought if he was doing something like that, it must be worthy. And um, it just, it was so good having somebody I never worried um, if I was going to drop something on the set, I knew Joe would pick it up. Um, you know, at some point you, you get to know somebody so well, you're finishing their sentences. It's, it's a little like being married. <laughs> um, it annoys my husband when I finish his sentence, but sentences, but, uh, Joe Birch never minded because we were always thinking, you know, very much alike. Um, so it was just very comforting. And he says that I'm his favorite. He's had about like 10 you know, former television live wives. We uh we all lined up for a photo one time. And there was like ten of us. <laughs> that was well, good. so in twenty at the end of twenty fifteen, the, uh, the Jim Strickland transition team comes and knocking on your door. Was that something that it, was that just completely out of left field for you? It was so far off my radar that it was amazing. Um, when the transition team first reached out to me, I kind of ignored it because I thought, you know, they must be making a mistake. You know, I'm not sure why Jim Strickland would want to talk to me. And then uh, finally, his, his former law partner, uh, David Kustoff, reached out. And, and, and then I knew it was kind of serious. Uh, David and I have a daughter, our daughters go to school together. And he said, hey, you know, Jim Strickland's been trying to get a hold of you. And I said, yeah. He goes, he, he wants you to come be part of the administration. I think I probably sat on the phone for 20 seconds and didn't say anything <laughs> because I was so shocked. And David's like, hello, hello, are you still there? 
And, um, but I, I really had to think about um, making that transition because I had no intention of ever leaving Channel 5. I thought I was going to be there forever. And um, so there was a lot of, there was a lot of prayer, a lot of pros and cons lists, a lot of asking family members, what do you think I should do? And then I, I think at the end of the day, it was just Jim Strickland asked me to come help him serve the citizens of Memphis. And I, you know, having been a reporter and being on the other side and looking at city government and saying, why don't these folks just do A, B, and C? You know, it's so simple from the outside looking in. And I thought, you know, I, I talk about city government like I know how it should be done. And, you know, why don't I put my money where my mouth is and, and actually delve into serious service? What is it like to have, um, you know, be part of a servant leadership team? And so, you know, I, I ultimately said yes. Well, you know, I'll, I've often thought as, as I kind of looked around the, the SLT, the senior leadership team meeting in the mornings, that everybody around that, that table uh, was working kind of within their own career. You know, Alex Smith is in HR and Brian Collins and Shirley Ford were financial people. Uh, I don't want to leave anybody out, but you, you get what I mean. I, I had a law firm to go back to, but you really you really kind of burned your boat as you went from, uh, you know, broadcast journalism to uh, being the, the uh, chief communications officer for the city. Um, what was the biggest adjustment that you had to make in that transition? I want to actually say the pace and um, being on the other side of the microphone. Um, you know, we are always prided ourselves in television news about breaking news, you know, oh, we did, you know, breaking news story and we handle it so well, and we were the first to deliver it. And here in city government, you're almost on the inside of every breaking news story that has to do with the city well before anybody on the outside knows it's even going on. Um, it probably took me about eight months maybe nine, maybe even 10, uh, before I was like, okay, I can do this. <laughs> I mean, it was, it was a, it was a moment. I, I, you know, um, handling budgets, handling, uh, personnel, being responsible for people, um, building what is now our communications team. I mean, we started off with four people. We now have 24 people. Um, and it takes that many people to actually run an effective communications team. Um, but I think the, the pacing and being inside and having all this knowledge about all these things that I know are going to become news, um, that was a big adjustment in the pace. Um, I've never had more meetings in my life than I've had since I became involved in city government. And with the pandemic and going to webinars and, and teams meetings and go to meetings, um, those meetings even increased in my day. So it's, it's kind of amazing um, the transition that, that took place. It, it took quite a bit of an adjustment. Sure. Yeah, I, I don't know quite how to ask this question, but you know, again, going from one side to the other, does if you were to go back to, you know, at some point, go back into the, the media, the fact that you were involved, does it humanize the players more so? In other words, you know, when you're, when you're outside and you're looking in, well, it's the city, it's the mayor, it's the city council. Now these are all people that you know. And does that put a kind of a different spin on how you, you think you might cover um, the news going forward, not because you know them and you're friends, but because you've seen the humanity of it. I think it would change it. Um, one of the things that actually sort of hurt my heart when I came into this um, was how deeply unknowledgeable I was about city government. You know, you work on the outside of something and think you know it 
very, very well. And the truth is that you, you don't know and you couldn't know until you were here in this environment, in this atmosphere. And what's actually kind of shocking is the number of reporters out there who cover city government who don't know. Um, they don't know where to look. They don't know where to research. And they don't take the time to cultivate sources and to get to know people as they should. Um, I have stood back really in horror and watched um, some of the coverage of um, city issues and also of the people who are a part of city government and just been amazed. Um, you know, whether it's, in my opinion, lazy reporting or just lack of knowledge or um, quite frankly, um, you know, certain people's own agendas. Reporters have agendas. Um, it's, it's been a little disheartening. And um, sometimes I, I feel kind of sad about my former profession. And I try to look back on it and say, I, I hope that I didn't approach this story this way. Um, but it was very humbling to come in and realize how, how much I did not know um, about how city government works. Um, it was quite frankly embarrassing and humiliating. But it, you know, being on the inside of it and seeing how hard people work, not just the mayor, but um, all the division directors and all the people who work under them and all the people who um, provide city services. Um, it's, been, it's been humbling. And I understand how hard city employees work. And it gives you a different perspective. I think city employees a lot of times get a bad rap about um, not working hard and um, just, you know, you're sucking tax dollars away and what do we get? But you actually, we actually provide um, a very, very good product um, that only breaks down about 2% of the time. And, um, you know, the truth is, is that um, these folks work really hard and that's from our mayor to our city council members who, you know, we may disagree with them on certain issues, but they think they're doing the right things and they think they're doing the right things for the citizens of Memphis. So it's, it does humanize people. And 2021, I think a lot of us have become really cynical about institutions. And, you know, there, there's a lot of justification for that. Sure. But I think it's important to, re to remember that institutions are made up of people. And I can only speak to city government. I, there are just so many people in city government that love the city of Memphis and are doing what they do out of that love, they could be making more money or doing more things other places. Um, and that sounds kind of schmaltzy, but it's it's the truth. And I think when people ask me, what was the biggest surprise you had going to work for the city? I won't say I was pleasantly surprised at just how much uh, care and passion there is. I may not agree with everybody all the time, but um, as you say, from the city council, the mayor, to uh, you know, rank and file employees is uh, a lot of good going on every day by people who uh, work for the city of Memphis. So true, so true, and and they're just so dedicated, and and that comes from the top too. I mean, you know, I know you were teasing about us being obligated to say nice things about James Griffin, <laughs> but you know, um, leadership matters, and so if the person at the top is saying. I'm going to work hard and be held accountable. Makes everybody else say the same thing. And um, that's what's been great um, about working with this team and the other folks who are on the senior leadership team. You know, um, they're there working just as hard as the mayor is, um, trying to make sure that not only does he look good and is well represented, but that the city looks good and is well represented. And it's, it's amazing. Um, I think the other thing that's helpful too is that there's, there's no, uh, you know, someone asked me one time, you know, how, how is it that you all are able to um, hold big stories or big events in confidence and nobody finds out about them and, and you know, um, how are you guys doing all these things um, with the TDZ and, and making all these changes and, you know, making all these, this progress. And, you know, one of the things I said was, well, for starters, you know, the mayor's got this incredible team and we're all learning from each other. 
which is very important. And I said, but also nobody on that team is trying to be mayor. You know, there's no undercutting of Jim Strickland. Nobody's trying to jockey for position or, you know, become the, you know, next elected mayor of the city. And I think, I think that makes a difference. And I think that may have been something that we haven't seen in previous administrations. Well, I know that that was the transition team's goal was to, to get people in leadership positions that had, you know, that had competence and, and had experience and commitment to the mission of their particular role, as opposed to, you know, paying off a lot of political favors by, by putting people in, in various roles. And, uh, you know, it was a gamble on one level because it's a little unorthodox politically, but I think it really has paid off for, for the city uh, for the reason that you say. I mean, we had some uh, passionate debates, and I'm sure you still do in, in, amongst the leadership team. But uh, once the decision was made, I can't think of a single time that win, lose, or draw, everybody on that team said, okay, that's what we're doing. And they all pitched in, and that is rare. It, not just in politics, but in business and life, it's rare that you have a team that cohesive. Yeah, I, I agree. And I hope some of the things that have changed, there, there was not a, a C-suite or a senior leadership structure um, prior to city government, prior to 2016. But that's one of the things I hope survives. And I hope that survives for, um, you know, the next incoming mayor, you know, whomever that may be. Um, just because the reporting structure, the way it was before with a CAO just reporting to the mayor, you, you can't manage it all. You just can't. So you, you've got to have, you've got to have some trust in the, in the people who are, who are working with you and um, being able to have some other folks manage it alongside you, I think is, is helpful to good governance. Right. That's exactly right. Uh, well, well uh, Ursula, that, those are all the questions I had and it looks like we're just about out of time. So um, I, I really appreciate you doing the show and uh, you class the place up quite a bit. Uh, and uh, I just appreciate uh, you doing this so much. Well, um, I have to tell you, Alan, we miss you. And um, to be completely transparent, we still call on you from time to time to help us out with things going on at the state legislature, and we appreciate that as well. And, um, you know, nobody knows what this is like unless you've been here, and so you know how it is. It's great. I still have our our picture um, of the whole team. Um, that, that may be the had. only one. I think that may be the only one. And I think it was like, bring your dog to work day. It was. It was bring your dog to work day. And the fire department brought, was his name, Wilson? Wilson, yes. And and uh, we put it, we put, they put it on, or I guess you put it on the mayor's Facebook page. I copied it and put it on mine. And that was the biggest uh, click fest I've ever had on a social media post. And I, I, you know, I tell Jim that was because I had the mayor on my, I think it's because I had the dog. I think it was the dog. I think it was the dog, but don't tell Jim that. <laughs> yeah, it's a, it's a great picture, and that's the original team right there. So it's it's fun to look at. Well, very good. All right. Well, uh, Ursula, thank you so much. Thank everybody for listening. If you've enjoyed this podcast, and you know, come on, let's not kid ourselves. This was a great podcast. This was a good one. Please share it on social media. Email it to folks you think might be interested in it. And if you've got uh, some questions uh, for us, uh, send us an email at uh, uh, acrone at cronelawfirmplc.com. You see the, the uh, email there in, in, uh, on the screen. And uh, uh, Ursula is going to go back to uh, serving the city, the citizens of the city of Memphis, and I'm going to go get some justice. So thank you all for listening, and I'll see you next time.